Howdy, it's Kyle with another installment of Examining Interesting Maps. This is part six in the series, and I will leave links to the other five in the description and one up here. And I know a lot of folks subscribe to this channel just for these videos, and thank you very much. I do appreciate that, and I will continue to post videos in this series, so look for the next one coming soon. And because I'm not big on clickbait, I'll leave a timestamp to the map that I think is the worst one of the U.S., but let's get started with Examining Interesting Maps. Part 6. This first map is a beautiful map that shows the U.S. divided up into 100 states of equal population. Each one has about 3.3 million people. This was made by Doug Alcido. This is a beautiful map, some wonderful cartography. I really like the names he gave to these individual states as well. They actually show some good research into the region. Which means I was born in Sacramento, raised in San Joaquin, went to college in Los Angeles, Went to graduate school in Palmetto, spent some time in Orlando, and now I live in Cumberland. And this map really shows clearly just how sparsely populated the Great Plains are and the interior west. The title of this map says it all. No real surprises here. The southeast has mostly pine woods, or in the case of Louisiana and Florida, swamp. My first time visiting Maine was 2021, and yeah, it's about 90% forested. And then you have Nevada. There are some forested areas around Lake Tahoe, but the rest of the state is desert. This map shows 120 years of growing season in the contiguous U.S. and how it's changed through the years. And you can see that most of the U.S. has had the growing season increase over the course of the past 125 years or so. But what you see in Georgia and just to the east South Carolina and to the west Alabama where you have shortening growing season is that it's just too hot down there now. So with Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina, the summers are hotter, but the winters are still kind of chilly. And in terms of agriculture, Georgia's relative importance has been going down for many years. This map shows time zones and how it's going to be permanently from 2023 moving forward. Personally, I think that going to only daylight time is kind of short-sighted, and I doubt it lasts very long, maybe only a couple of years. And if you live up north at the western end of a time zone, you are going to hate this more than anybody. In late December and early January, parts of the UP of Michigan, Central North Dakota, and Western Montana won't see sunrise until about 9.30 a.m. And from late December to early January, basically the entire northern third of the country will have sunrise after 9 a.m. So expect some cranky youpers in the office in winter mornings. We go from time zones to zip codes. Nothing at all surprising about this, just kind of a neat thing to see in map form. I think the new nickname for New Jersey should be the discontiguous zero. Now let's take a look at a couple of worldwide agricultural maps. And this shows where the main type of livestock are throughout the earth. Cattle has the largest distribution globally and has the largest pure number of the larger animals. You can essentially see the borders of India on that map. A ton of beef in eastern South America, especially southern Brazil and northern Argentina. I find the ducks one to be very interesting because I never really considered ducks to be livestock. But China and Bangladesh love their ducks. You also see some ducks in France. That's probably because of foie gras in cuisine. Goats are distributed worldwide, but mostly in tropical areas. And that's largely because in tropical areas you have a lot of lush vegetation growing very quickly, and goats are natural lawnmowers. The livestock with by far the most number is chickens. Chickens don't like the cold very much, so not many in the Arctic areas. But look at Australia. What's up with that, you poultry haters? Americans and Canadians might be surprised by how many sheep there are distributed worldwide. So Australia and New Zealand, they hate chicken, but they love their lamb. And lastly, pigs. Two places on this map are really highlighted, China and the U.S. state of Iowa. But look at the vast emptiness of hogs in northern Africa and southwest Asia. Here's another worldwide agricultural map, this time for nuts. And do keep in mind that despite the name, a peanut is not actually a nut. Growing up in the Central Valley of California where there's so many almonds, pistachios, and walnuts, I just learned to love tree nuts. And the Brazil nuts, cashews, and macadamias are grown in tropical areas. But overall, this is just a very good looking map. Here's a map that shows distribution of wild ungulates in Europe. And it's just fun to say ungulate. These are large hooved animals. A. Wild boar and B. Roe deer are both found throughout most of Europe. C. Is the red deer. D are moose, and those are almost entirely in Scandinavia and the Baltic countries. E are reindeer, found only in Norway and Finland on this map, but maybe a few in Sweden. 
F is the European bison, and just like across the U.S., these things were decimated to the point where there really aren't that many left. G is the chamois, with the red ones being Pyrenean and the blue ones being Alpine. And H are ibex. The red ones are the Iberians and the blue ones are Alpine. A thousand years ago, this map would probably be almost entirely blue. Probably not the British Isles or northern Scandinavia, but just about the rest of it. There are a bunch of overlay maps like this that compare the size of one country to another. So this is a random one that I chose highlighting Japan over Europe. And there are 150 million people in Japan, which is way more densely populated than Europe as a whole. And you can make maps like this yourself at the website thetruesize.com and you can basically overlay any country over any other one. This is the first of two maps showing the contiguous U.S. overlaid with other places, this one Antarctica. With most map projections, especially Mercator projection, Antarctica will look way bigger than this. And this one shows the contiguous U.S. overlaid with Mars. And that giant canyon in the middle is called Valles Marineris. And for some of the younger folks watching this, there might be a chance in your future where you get to visit this in person as a Mars tourist. This map shows where the vast majority of folks in China live. China and the U.S. are about the same size, so imagine 300 million people living in just the eastern half of the U.S. And a grand total of 30 million in the entire western half of the U.S. This map shows the official results of the 2019 North Korean election. And yes, North Korea does have elections. People do go to the polls there. And as you can see, Kim Jong-un's party won 100% of the vote across the entire country. And as the whippersnappers might say, looks kind of sus. But what a name for that party, the Democratic Front for the Reunification of the Fatherland. Here's the geographic distribution of giraffe patterns in Africa. Really cool. I had no idea this was a thing, although it makes perfect sense. It's really interesting that the ones in East Africa around Kenya don't seem to interbreed. And I didn't even know there were giraffes in West Africa. So before we took a look at ungulates in Europe, now let's look at moose in North America. And you can see a clear line of heavy moose population across Alaska, southern Yukon, northeastern British Columbia, central Alberta and Saskatchewan, southern Ontario and Quebec, and the New England area of the U.S. And they also follow the spine of the Rocky Mountains all the way down to southwestern Colorado. And apparently moose have taken over all of Newfoundland. Here's a beautiful map showing the distribution of active oil and gas wells in Texas. It's hard to tell from the legend, but the red areas are natural gas, blue is oil, and yellow are the urban areas. And I have to admit, I was a little surprised to see this map. I thought there was much more overlap between the oil and natural gas areas. That giant section of blue in West Texas is the Permian Basin. And there has been huge population and job growth in the towns of Odessa and Midland right there. You look in the middle part of the state where there's hardly any oil or natural gas, that's mostly Texas hill country. And in the southwest is where you have the dry desert mountainous part of the state. And just the way the distribution of these wells are leads this map to be basically art. This is just a really good map. It shows exactly what it needs to show and it's presented very well just a basic shaded relief map, but it looks beautiful. I know I tend to emphasize physical geography than just about any other geography channel, but this map is why. And what this map depicts has much more of an impact on your day-to-day -day life than whoever your governor or senators are. Whether it be agriculture or water availability or amount of snowfall, areas susceptible to various natural hazards, and so many other things about the U.S. are dictated by the underlying physical geography. Here are the most popular surnames by state. So you'll see the areas with a lot of Scandinavians and Germans, Johnson being the most popular last name. In California and Texas, Garcia is number one. And you'll see the Hispanic last names often rank high on things like this. And that's because there aren't anywhere near as many Hispanic surnames as Anglo ones. Think about Anglos in the US, they come from all different kinds of places, the British Isles, Germany, Scandinavia. But all of the Hispanic last names come from Spain. It's also interesting to note that Jones used to be the second most common last name in the U.S., and now it's only in the top three for four states. Here's a map done entirely by statistical analysis, and it shows exactly what it says, the most disproportionately popular job. Not a lot of surprises here, but take a look at Arizona. Home entertainment installers? It's kind of strange. I had to look up what a roustabout is for North Dakota, but it's an oil drill worker. Missouri has locker and coat room attendants. And Pennsylvania, what is going on up there? Bad roads, a lot of deer, a lot of car accidents, I'm not sure. 
And then you got Florida. You just can't make this stuff up. And now, as promised, what I think the worst map of the U.S. is this abomination. It's the map to a board game called Ticket to Ride. It's a great game and everyone I've introduced it to loves it, but the map is terrible. So we'll start off our tour of this wonderful map in the beautiful city of Boston, New Hampshire. Or maybe it's Boston, Maine. But we'll go from there. We'll take the train over to Toronto, Ontario, which of course is closer to Lake Huron than Lake Ontario. And then over to Sault Ste. Marie, which everyone in Michigan knows is west of the bridge. And then we'll mosey on down to Chicago, Indiana, check out some of those gorgeous north-facing beaches on Lake Michigan. And now let's go down south to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is apparently near High Point now. I know Atlanta is in North Georgia, but it's not that far north. And Miami, in an attempt to lessen hurricane vulnerability, moved inland. Houston followed Miami's advice and decided to move itself a little more inland. Little Rock, Arkansas took a little bump going north. And kind of like Little Rock, Oklahoma City got a little bump to the north. We'll go up to Omaha, which I'll give them a little bit of a break. Part of that dot is in Nebraska, but most of it's in Iowa. And then to the Twin Cities region in Minnesota, which is home to the capital, Duluth. Helena, Montana straight up pulled an Eric Cartman. Screw you guys, I'm going to Billings. Denver slid a little bit south. And then down to my favorite city in my favorite state, El Paso, New Mexico. Las Vegas is now along the Arizona border, and apparently some of it is now on Lake Mead. Heading up to the northwest, Seattle now sits on the east shore of a lake. And Vancouver was just getting sick of that beautiful coastal scenery. I do love the game, and I highly recommend playing it, but this map is awful. So that was part six of examining interesting maps, and look for part seven in this series about three to four months following the date of this one. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve, and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about U.S. geography, cross-country road tripping, and I tend to be kind of nerdy, so no politics or hyperbole on this channel. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.